Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Operating Officer Uber, Barney Harford, in discussion with Skift Executive Editor, Founding Editor, Dennis Shaw. Barney, thank you for being here. Absolutely, great to be here. Thanks Everyone for having remember to do Slido. I think you have that down by now. First, I wanted to give a shout out to all my Uber drivers out there. Ralph from Staten Island, yo. Juanita from Jersey City. Jenny from the block. No, no, not Jenny. Barney is number two at, uh, at Uber, he's COO. And uh, he's had a very interesting journey, if you don't know. It's a, a typical travel industry journey, wink, wink. He started working at Expedia in 1999, became head of uh, Expedia Asia Pacific. In 2009, he became CEO of a nearly bankrupt Orbitz, fought with Expedia, ex competed against Expedia um, over booking fees and loyalty programs, you name it. And in 2015, he neatly sold his company to Expedia for $1.6 billion, made a lot of money for, for investors. So you can't really make this stuff up. So you arrive at Uber. Uh, the Expedia CEO first bolted to Uber about a year ago. And Barney arrived there uh, as COO a couple months later. You arrive at Uber in late 2017. There's a ton of issues there, right? Um, it's a global brand. You're losing a lot of money every quarter. There are safety issues, regulatory issues, legal issues, privacy issues. And importantly, uh, there's a bro culture there, notorious. And uh, an investigation led to the firing of uh, dozens of employees. So you've been there less than a year. What kind of progress do you, do you think you've made so far? Yeah, well, thanks for the intro. <laughs> and uh, great to be here. Uh, you know, when, when Dara took the job, uh, you know, we, were, we were chatting back and forth very, very quickly. And uh, uh, by the end of the first week, you know, we were sitting down together and he was sharing some of the, the, the information he was learning about the company. And you know, what really excited me was the scale of the opportunity. Uh, this is a business that today is doing more rides around the world, five billion a year, than all the world's airlines put together carry passengers. Uh, and the opportunity, I'm mean, just getting started, the opportunity to have an impact on uh, the development of our cities, the way we live in the future, uh, was very clear given that scale and given the expansive nature of the, of the company's vision. Uh, but clearly, you know, the, you, you know, it's not the opportunity for Dara and I to come in and take, uh, take this role, or uh, these roles at the company wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been some s serious challenge at the company. And 2017 was a really bad year uh, for the company. And uh, we've come in, uh, Dara has been really clear about uh, the most important things for the company. Uh, he set a very clear uh, cultural value uh, that we will do the right thing, establishing uh, that we have new leadership, uh, new CEO, a new commitment uh, to uh, the right behavior, and uh, really importantly, a commitment to partnership. So working with cities around the world uh, to help solve their problems. And I think that is the start. We've still got a lot of work to do. Uh, there's still much more uh, that we need to work on. But I, I do feel that you know, 12 months in, uh, you know, we're making progress. So how? How difficult is it to turn around a, a corporate culture? And how important is it to lead by example? So look, it's uh, t turning around internet companies in general is tough. It was something that I, I stepped into back uh, at Orbitz in 2009, uh, and, 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 and we were successful, but it, it, it took a lot of work. Uh, Uber, different scale of challenges. Uh, you know, and, and some of the, the the cultural uh, issues you know, that, that we're dealing with here you know, are, are, are really significant. So as I said, on the external side, uh, you know, we've, we've made substantial progress in terms of uh, set, setting, uh, you know, setting out what's important. We inherited a, a, a company when we think internally. Um, I think one of the things that's, that's, that's most, uh, most important is as we think internally about the culture uh, is 
the inclusion and the, the, the spirit of, of inclusion at the company. Uh, we inherit a company that, that from a uh, representation of women and people of color was really challenged. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do uh, to, uh, to improve that, to go and create the diverse, uh, the diverse culture that we want. And we all know that that's incredibly important if we're building a service for a, a diverse group of riders and, and drivers around the world. Uh, we have to have that representation uh, of women, of uh, r racial representation and, and uh, representation of nationalities. So this is something which is, which is super important. Uh, as we think about this, you know, we've received feedback. I personally have received feedback. I take it very seriously, uh, and it's something that, that I'm very focused on. It's something that a leadership team, uh, as an entire leadership team, we're very focused on, how we are perceived uh, within the organization and how we can be a force for change. So talk about uh, your vision for the company. Okay, so you just did a redesign, you know, you got rid of, um, you know, not an Uber is spelt out with its own font, the whole word, world, word. Um, but it's not just about ride sharing. So talk about what your vision sure. for Uber is. You know, the vision for Uber is, uh, you know, rede redefining urban mobility. So we think about mobility uh, as a service. And this is about the transportation of both people and things. Uh, and those are the kind of two parts of the business that we, that we really think about, and there's obviously a lot of interactions between them. Uh, uh, when we think about the transportation of things, Uber Eats uh, is an incredibly exciting part of the business. Uh, the growth rates we're seeing, the business is less than three years old. It is already the largest food delivery platform in the world outside of China. Um, and uh, we are growing every week. We're launching into new cities uh, and transforming the way that the, 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 the eaters around the world uh, interact with food, building a really fascinatingly complex three-sided marketplace where you've got the, the restaurants, eaters, and couriers. Uh, when it comes to the transportation of, of, of people, uh, the opportunity for us to stitch together a broad suite of modalities uh, to really nail the opportunity to, to provide a compelling alternative uh, to car ownership. That's the, that's the vision that we have. So it started with, uh, with the car. I started with uh, Uber Black and, and your, 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 your alternative to a, to, to a limo. Uh, Uber X is now far and away the largest product. Uh, but as Dara says, you know, uh, cars are to Uber like books uh, are to Amazon. It's just what is getting started. And so uh, we have iterated on the kind of the core car uh, product Uber X uh, using uh, pool and ride sharing, so getting two bums in seats, three bums in seats, to allow us to bring down the price while at the same time ma maintaining earnings uh, for, for our drivers and dealing with issues of congestion and pollution. Um, but then we're going beyond that, so uh, we made an acquisition of uh, Jump uh, for e-bikes. We now have uh, Jump bikes in 10 cities, including uh, a number of uh, uh, boroughs here in, 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 in New York. Uh, we are getting into the scooter business. Um, and we are looking around the world at new modalities that we can tap into. For example, I was in India recently, uh, Uber Moto. Uh, you'll have a motorbike driver. Uh, he, he, he drives around with, uh, he or she drives around with, with, with two, two helmets uh, and a little blue hygiene cover, and then the, 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 the passenger will don a helmet and ride on the back of the, of, of the motorbike. What about uh, logistics for business? Is that part of the, the vision? So the way, the, way we, the way we deal, so we have, we have uh, an organization called Uber for Business, Uber for Business has got 65,000 organizations today around the world that are using Uber for Business to procure uh, transportation services uh, for mm -hmm. their employees uh, and their customers and or uh, food delivery services through Uber Eats. Uh, and what we believe uh, with, with Uber for Business is we can really streamline and enhance the control that uh, a company, a corporation, or a university uh, uh, can have uh, over the spend for its transportation. Uh, if you think about the old world where you know, people would pay cash and get a receipt and have to go and expense it, now that process can be streamlined. And one of our expensing partners, Certify, uh, you know, announced in 2016 that Uber is now the most expensed item right. across the United States. Yep. And so ensuring that seamless nature is, is super important. So it's no secret that an IPO is on the horizon. There's probably not a lot you could say about that, but how does Uber start making money? How does, how does Uber become profitable? I believe um, you're, you're on track for about 10 billion in revenue this year, 
but you lost uh, you know, six, $660 million in the second quarter. So how does Uber get profitable? And in the short term, do you have to get profitable? Great question. So you, you're right, I don't have any specific comment on, on, on the IPO at this stage. Uh, but if we think about the business model uh, broadly, uh, I think it's important to understand the core rideshare business uh, is uh, solidly profitable, and in fact has been solidly profitable now for the last five quarters. Uh, now, we are playing in an incredibly large category, the global transportation category. It's a $6 trillion category. And so we see uh, in many of these adjacent areas substantial growth opportunities. I talked about bikes and scooters. Uh, we are investing uh, substantially in the development of autonomous uh, driving technologies. We are uh, building an ecosystem with Uber Elevate uh, to, uh, to create uh, urban, trans urban, uh, aerial tra uh, uh, urban flight transport transportation of the future. Uh, by 2023, we expect to launch uh, eVTOL uh, transportation within our cities. And so these, these are areas that we, we think it continues to make sense to, to, to invest in. What's important for us is to be able to show the path to that profitability uh, and to show uh, the profitable nature of the core uh, business that we're building, while at the same time uh, we invest into these new categories. I did give a shout out to my drivers before. And what I hear is we're not making enough money. Uber promises, promises us this percentage, and we're not getting, getting that percentage. So how can, and I've seen you guys advertising about you know, drivers being you know, stakeholders. So how really can you improve uh, the lot of drivers, and why shouldn't uh, drivers be employees of Uber? So look, our, our driver partners and courier partners around the world are an incredible part uh, incredibly important part of, of, of the business and the relationship uh, that we have as an organization with them is, is very, very important to us. Uh, I think when I sit down and, and, and talk with, with, with drivers, uh, one of the most important things for them is flexibility. Uh, the ability for them to set their own schedule right. uh, and to allow uh, that, uh, the work that they do uh, on our platform uh, to line up with their other commitments in their life. Mm -hmm. um, also, when I'm traveling around the world, I think one of the things that really stands out uh, talking to both drivers but also governments is the role that we play in creating micro-entrepreneurship opportunities around the world. Uh, I was in Egypt uh, a few months ago and sitting down with, with, with one of the, uh, the representatives of the government. And just being able to talk about the 200,000 uh, Egyptian drivers that we had on the platform, mm -hmm. many of whom had been structured unemployed before. Uh, similarly, in France, uh, uh, conversations Dara's had with President Macron, how we're helping address the issues of structural unemployment in the Borneo outside of Paris. Uh, similarly, I was in Saudi Arabia, 100,000 uh, Saudi, Saudi drivers. This ability to create economic growth and uh, bring, uh, bring folks who had uh, previously unemployed in, into, the, into the workforce, I think is a really important problem. There's no doubt that you're creating opportunity, but um, you're, you're, you're saying that the, the flexible nature of the job precludes them becoming employees, or, or is that what you're saying? Well, so to, to, the, to the question of independent contractor versus right. employee, look, I think it's a, if you look at this industry, if you look at people who are providing transportation, you know, taxi drivers, et cetera, th these are self-employed people. Uh, and I think we're very clear uh, in uh, the independent nature of the work that the drivers have. And we know the value that they place on flexibility. Uh, and so I think we're very clear both from a, a, a legal perspective, but also from a philosophical perspective, uh, the types of opportunities that, that, that we want to provide and we're able to provide through the platform. Let's talk about the same. Let me, let me, one, yeah. one other point I will say on that one, though. I think one of the areas that I think, uh, the, one of the reasons why this is such an important area, uh, if we think about the policy debate, is uh, around the provision of benefits uh, to, to uh, gig economy participants. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been at the forefront of that. Uh, earlier this year, we announced uh, a, a partner protection program uh, in Europe whereby we are uh, providing uh, a set of on-app and also off-app protections for our driver partners and courier partners uh, that will give them protections if they are injured you know, while, while they are uh, driving, uh, but will also give them important benefits such as uh, maternity 
and paternity uh, benefits. These are really important ways that I think we're leading in kind of creating uh, these protections for, for new economy workers. Uh, and I think that's the kind of thing that we would like to be at the forefront of you know, around the world. Speaking of protections, let's talk about the safety issue. There was yeah. the no notorious rape in India that, of, of a passenger. Uh, I'm sure there have been plenty of other incidents. Uh, what's new on the safety front, both for drivers and for passengers? Sure. So, uh, see, see, when, when Dara came to the company, uh, it, it was very clear, and, and he articulated very quickly uh, that the most important priority for the company uh, was safety. Safety is our number one priority. Um, it is something uh, that we are deeply committed uh, to investing behind, uh, and we are committed to using technology and investing in technology to make this a true differentiator uh, for, for Uber. If you think back to the world before ride sharing um, and the lack of protections, the lack of GPS uh, tracking of where, of where you were, the lack of visibility into you know, using a use of a rating system uh, or the lack of uh, an ability uh, to share your positioning uh, with, with, with a loved one. Uh, the, there's been substantial progress that has been made uh, as, we, as we've ushered in the world of ride sharing. Um, but we are committed to making ongoing investments to make this safer. For example, uh, we rolled out a pilot now in 30 different jurisdictions uh, whereby it's, it's called Ride Alert, uh, a number of different components to Ride Alert. Uh, one of them is if you were to call 911, uh, we would on the back end be able to share your precise location uh, with the 911 dispatch center. Uh, we also have uh, crash detection, so if the, if the driver's app uh, suddenly decelerates, uh, you know, we say, hey, has, has something happened, and we'll, we'll initiate a call. Uh, also looking to see whether there are uh, uh, anomalous uh, location information we're receiving from the rider app and the driver app. There's a number of things that we're able to go and do. In Brazil, for example, uh, we have uh, brought together our data scientists uh, and uh, our engineers to develop machine learning algorithms that can allow us to, um, uh, to prevent certain potentially unsafe trips uh, from happening. So there's things that we believe we can do given our scale given the ability to use data to really transform this, this, this safety landscape, and it is something which is incredibly important to us. Is there anything you can do to transform the airport experience? Uh, yeah, does anybody care about that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. It's, a, it's an area I'm super passionate about uh, coming from the travel space, and I thought, I thought we might have a few people here who'd be interested in that. <laughs> so. Uh, we believe that, that, I mean, if you look at the scale of our airport engagement today, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing. Uh, I had the team pull, pull the stats. I don't think we've shared this number before. Uh, we do 250 million trips either to or from airports every year. Um, and uh, while that seems like a large number, uh, we're still actually only scratching the service. That, that, that represents about 5% of the departures slash arrivals uh, into, in, into airports uh, around the world. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to improve that. Some of the things that we're doing, if you, if you, again, this is the opportunity to use technology to enhance the experience. So we've got a product called Rematch. It takes a driver who is dropping a passenger off at an airport and uh, makes them immediately av available for a pickup from the airport. And, for, I'm sure any of you who've used Uber at an airport, typically, you know, you, you'll be pulling somebody from an off-location off lot, and it could be a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten-minute uh, uh, ETA. Right. Uh, in, in tests at, uh, at, at Newark, uh, we've been able to reduce the average ETA from eight minutes when, when it's a regular uh, dispatch to three minutes when it's a rematch. And we rolled out rematch uh, this week uh, across 250 airports. Right. So real opportunity to improve. We're putting beacons and Wi-Fi access points uh, around airports to allow for that location to be better served and to know where people are going. So it's, it's something we're super excited about. We think it can get so much better, uh, and we are excited to work with airport authorities to enhance that experience and to work with airlines to create a seamless experience from your home to your destinations and back again. Let's go to some audience questions. Lyft arguably, arguably has a friendlier brand presence than Uber. Do you have plans to try to change that and how? I hear this from some drivers too that, uh, you know, they like, you know, they do both and yeah. they sometimes like working for Lyft better. Yeah, so 
we've uh, we've spent a lot of time uh, over the course of this year thinking about how to how to how to evolve the brand. Uh, I'm really excited. We announced uh, just a week or two ago that uh, we have appointed a chief marketing officer, uh, Rebecca Messina, who's joining us. She used to, used to be CMO uh, at uh, Beam Centurion before that 20 years at Coca-Cola. Uh, so I'm super excited to have her come in and, and, and be able to bring together the marketing organization from, for, for Uber around the world. Uh, right now we have groups, you know, uh, groups in different mega regions. Um, but you know, one of the things that we wanted to do in terms of the, the, our brand architecture this year uh, was, first of all, to kind of make it clear that we do have a new CEO, a new, a new management, uh, and a new direction. And we accomplished that with the ads that we ran uh, a couple of months ago that Dara uh, featured in. He's very happy that we'd have a new set of ads that no longer feature him. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> he, doesn't get, he didn't love being, being the talent. Uh, well, I think he did a pretty good job. Uh, the new set of ads that we've got, though, uh, are very much designed to create an emotional connection uh, between uh, Uber and our riders, uh, Uber and our drivers, and to emphasize uh, the kind of the, 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 the idea that kind of comes from you know, our mission, like our movement ignites opportunity, the way that we help connect riders and drivers with opportunity in their lives. And that, that's, that's what we're trying to do, establish that, that emotional connection. We've talked a lot about drivers, but isn't the future of mobility driverless? You, uh, you had that uh, tragic accident in, in Arizona, um, what about driverless cars? Sure. So, um, the the I think we, we when, we when we look at the autonomous future, uh, it is uh, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's not something that's going to happen in the next two or three years. This is a long term uh, a long term evolution. Uh, as a company, we think it is important for us uh, to be. Uh, at the, to, to be investing in this area uh, because uh, we want to make sure that there's not one company that monopolizes you know, autonomous technologies. Uh, at the same time, you know, we're doing it with a spirit of partnership. Uh, we announced a half a billion dollar investment uh, from Toyota uh, and the fact that Toyota is going to be one of the, uh, the OEM groups that will be, will be using our technology. Our goal is to create te technology that can be deployed across multiple in industry participants. And I, and I think that uh, it's going to be a long, a long proce process. There's a lot of, of mapping that needs to be done on a street-by-street -street basis. Uh, for a long time, uh, autonomous vehicles are going to sit alongside um, uh, uh, human-driven human vehicles. It will be an evolution over time. Uh, if you think about the, 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 the road fatality rates, on 40,000 uh, fatalities on the roads in the U.S. every year, one and a half million around the world, mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that an autonomous future will help uh, bring... Uh, that down, uh, but but it's uh, it's going to take a long time. We have 20 seconds. Uh, what steps are you taking to recruit and hire women and diverse employees, uh, and also on the board level? Sure. So um, yeah, this is something which is super important to us. Uh, we are doing a lot of things here uh, in, in, as we think about our uh, recruiting processes, as we think about uh, how do we prioritize. Uh, diverse candidates, how do we create a diversity window, so a, a, few, a few weeks at the beginning of, of, of roles being posted uh, to allow us to prioritize diverse candidates. Uh, as we think about our processes for interviewing, both making sure that we have uh, diverse loops, uh, diverse panels, so not just the candidates, but also the, the, the folks who are interviewing uh, uh, are, are truly diverse. Uh, and also really thinking through some of the processes uh, within that recruiting uh, process and, and to, to what extent that those can be introducing subconscious biases. For example, the use of the panel interview uh, and certain other criteria. We're also, however, it's not just about recruiting uh, from the outside. It's also about what we're doing uh, in terms of uh, promotion. And so we're being very analytic about understanding promotion velocity uh, mm -hmm. across our organization. In fact, you know, uh, just this promotion cycle, uh, we uh, actually achieved uh, equal uh, promotion velocity for, for men and for women across the organization, which, you know, it, it shouldn't, shouldn't be groundbreaking, but it is, it is real progress. And so Barney, we have a bunch of questions for you, but we're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hey, enjoyed it. Thanks, Barney.